All right, where we left off last time was Bohr with his model of the atom, which consisted of the nucleus with the protons and the neutrons, and then outside of the nucleus, the electron would orbit, and these are not drawn to scale. They should be round. Wow, that's bad. But anyway, the electron orbits around the nucleus in these nice spherical orbits, which I can't draw. And each of the orbits around the nucleus is labeled with the value of n. n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. And if we use those numerical values 1, 2, and 3, we can get exactly the wavelengths that we see for hydrogen when it comes to plugging them in to the Rydberg equation. As long as we use the Rydberg constant, we get exactly the wavelengths that we see in the visible spectrum. The problem is, is that doesn't work for anything besides hydrogen. It doesn't work at all. This form of the equation doesn't work at all for anything besides things with one electron. And if it doesn't work for anything besides things with one electron, it's not very useful. It's wrong, but it is a good starting place. All right, I'm going to skip ahead. Basically what we learned, I'm going to skip ahead quickly, I guess I should say. Basically what scientists did is in investigating what was going on, they realized it was way more complicated than this. And I'm going to be giving you results of what they discovered, not necessarily why, because to be honest with you, I don't understand all of it. There are about five people on the planet that really understand this stuff, and I'm not one of them. But essentially what they discovered in looking at other atoms and investigating the way that the atoms behaved is that the electrons don't orbit around the nucleus, but they live in regions of space. Those regions of space they called orbitals. They named it orbitals sort of to pay homage to Bohr coming up with the idea of an orbit, which was wrong but they wanted to sort of use the same, they used him as a stepping stone to figure out what was going on, so we call them orbitals. An orbital is a region of space where an electron lives. These regions of space are very, very complicated. They are essentially in three dimensions around the nucleus, but they are not simply spherical regions of space, although some of them are, not all of them are. The, the, the shapes of the orbitals get rather complicated, and the shapes of the orbitals are governed by a formula called a wave function. The wave function for the electron is given the symbol psi, the Greek symbol psi, kind of like a pitchfork, and that wave function is a mathematical formula which describes these regions of space in which the electrons live. It's a mathematical formula that's very, very complicated. We're not going to write the formula for the wave function, but I will tell you that the nature of the wave function, once they solved for the wave function, it also has these um, variables, like we saw with the Bohr model of the atom and the Rydberg equation, and one of the variables is called n. And we chose to call it n because that's what we called it in the Bohr model. And the numerical values that n can be within the formula for the wave function uh, for the electron is 1, 2, 3, etc. n can be, or n is, I should say, whole number integers and n can go up to a value of infinity for the electron. So the electron has this particular uh, numerical value as part of its equation, and that does give us some insight into the energy as well as the size of the orbital that the electron is living in. Uh, we call this numerical value of n a quantum number. Um, the word quantum um, comes it, like we use in, in the, the area of chemistry called quantum mechanics, which is what this chapter is all about, this unit is all about. Um, quantum mechanics or a quantum number um, comes about because we say that energy is quantized. Quantized literally means countable, meaning that the energy of the electron is occurring at particular values. It can be this value or this value or this value or this value like a series of steps, as opposed to a ramp which would have a continuous, um, a continuous stream of possible values of energy. Uh, a set of stairs has only 
these possible values for energy or, or heights or levels. Um, and so quantized is like a set of stairs. It is not like a ramp because only particular values of energy are found. They're, we say that they're allowed for an electron. Um, and, and that's what we find. And that, that, that's why we only see particular wavelengths of lines in the emission spectrum of hydrogen. Um, and all atoms will give us an emission spectrum that it consists of lines of color. And those lines correspond to very distinct energy values that are allowed as the electron changes levels, however that's happening in the atom. It's not happening like Bohr predicted, where it's simply orbiting around the nucleus, or else this equation would have worked for everything. It's much more complicated than this, but it is like Bohr imagined. There are only certain values allowed. So quantum mechanics gives rise to the idea of this mathematical wave function for, an elect for the electrons, for the orbitals that the electrons live in. The orbitals are the regions of space. And I'm going to go about this a little backwards um, than the way our textbook goes through it, but I think that's OK. I'm going to describe these orbitals first. And then we'll go back to this idea of quantum mechanics and these quantum numbers that are part of the function, uh, wave function. The types of orbitals that we see in atoms um, start with a, an orbital that is spherical. This is three-dimensional, and it is a perfect sphere, regardless of my poor drawing here. Um, think of it as three dimensions. Axes going up, down, left, right, forward, and back, and a sphere sitting right there at the center of it. And we call this orbital an s orbital. Now let me show you a better picture of it. All right, an s orbital is a sphere on the center of the nucleus. Now we see here three pictures of this sphere, and they're different sizes, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But an s orbital is a spherical orbital centered on the nucleus of the atom. And we find these orbitals in atoms. We find electrons in these orbitals. And these electrons are governed by a mathematical formula that includes quantum numbers, which describes that it's in an s orbital. That's not the only shape that we see for orbitals in atoms. The second shape that we see is called a p orbital. We use lowercase for these. And I'm not even going to attempt to draw it. Let's go see what a p orbital looks like. A p orbital looks like a, let's look at this one. It looks like sort of lobes left and right of the nucleus. The nucleus would be right there at the center of the atom. And we see lobes. For example, in this first picture, the lobes go left and right. Now what we notice is that we always find the p orbitals in a set of three. And the set of three consists of lobes that go left and right of the nucleus, a set of lobes that go up and down from the nucleus, and a set of lobes that go front and back. This is representing three-dimensional space, so forwards and behind the nucleus. Now these three are all overlapping each other on the same nucleus, but we're showing them separate. We're showing them separate because it's easier to see what's going on if we see them separately. And so just to remind you, there was this s orbital, which was spherical. We only ever see these in a set of one. We didn't call it a set of one back then, because why would we call it a set of one? But we call it a set of one because we notice when we see the p orbitals, we see them in a set of three. And so these are the p orbitals. p orbitals are actually more, uh, the, the lobes are actually kind of fuller. But when we see drawn representations, we often see them sort of elongated out just because it makes it easier to see what's going on. So those are our p orbitals. And again, we see the p orbital in a set of three. All right, we don't just see s orbitals and p orbitals. We also see a different shape, and we will call them d orbitals. And let's go see what a d orbital looks like. I am not going to try to draw it. All right, d orbitals were now a little more complicated. Focus on this top picture. A d orbital is four lobes emanating from the nucleus, all at right angles from each other. 
And again, they're a little fuller than this, but usually when we draw them, we narrow them up. We, we, we thin them out a little bit, just it makes it easier to see what's going on. And you'll notice we see a set of five. We always see d orbitals in a set of five. The five orbitals are drawn here separately. This one looks a little odd, but you've got to trust me when I tell you that mathematically the same formula which governs these also governs that one. And they're all centered on the same nucleus of the same atom. We draw them separately because if we start trying to overlap these, it gets really confusing trying to tell what we're seeing. Um, again, we see the four lobes going in the y, z axis, in the x, z axis, in the x, y axis. These are along the x and the y axes, not in between them. And then this one is along the z axis, but we see these in a set of five. And so the d orbitals we see in a set of five. Now we could keep going from here because we see other types of orbitals. We see lots of types of orbitals. We see s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals. At this point, the next ones that we see, the next more complicated set that we see, we call f orbitals. I am not going to try to draw it. Let's go see what an f orbital looks like. All right, as we can see, f orbitals are getting a lot more complicated. So if we look to see what an f orbital looks like, <laughs> Not all of these are f orbitals. Uh, let's look at this picture. Here we go, down at the bottom. These, this shows the s's, the p's, the d's that we've already talk of, talked about. Here are the f orbitals, and we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lobes around the center. The shapes get a little uh, more variable here, but you got to believe me when I tell you mathematically. These are all the same wave function as far as describing this orbital up to a point. And you notice there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There is a set of seven f orbitals. So the f orbitals come in a set of seven. All seven of the orbitals are centered on the same nucleus. Um, they are all overlapping. That would get really confusing if we tried to draw it. And it's it's even more complicated than that because an atom with a nucleus has s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals, f orbitals, all existing in the space around the nucleus. And its electrons, the atom's electrons, go in these orbitals in a very predictable pattern. We'll talk about that. But they're all centered on the same nucleus. Now, there aren't any hard and fast and solid boundaries to these orbitals. They are simply regions of space, and if the electron has the wave function with the proper quantum numbers that tells it it's in one of these f orbitals, it knows where it's supposed to be, and it stays within this region of space. This is really strange stuff. This is really weird stuff. We don't have anything that exists on the planet that is big enough for us to see that acts like this. Um, so we don't have real good models for us to think about and visualize when we try to figure out and, and imagine the way that electrons behave in atoms, and that's what makes this topic really very fuzzy. It's, it's very, very conceptual, and it's very, very cool, and again, I encourage you to go and, and, and look into it even deeper, but that makes it harder to study. One last thing for this video. Um, we see these sets and we see more. I could go on. The next set of orbitals we see past f orbitals, um, I guess they got tired and started going alphabetical. So we also, the next type of orbital that we see are called g orbitals. And this is, it occurs in a set of nine. And I think you can see the patterns here. An s orbital is a set of one, a p orbital is a set of three, d orbitals is a set of five, f orbitals is a set of seven, g orbitals is a set of nine. Next, we would have h orbitals being a set of 11, then i orbitals with a set of 13. And I'm just kind of making this up. We don't normally talk about these orbitals uh, past f because they're not real important to us as chemists. But theoretically, they exist, and we could go on and on and on. The bottom line here is you have to memorize a few things. You have to memorize that there are these things called s orbitals, and then they exist in a set of one. P's exist in a set of three. D's in a set of five, and F's in a set of seven. 
We'll continue building this picture in the next video.